Okay. Uh, good afternoon to all of us who are here, to those of us who are uh, uh, on Zoom, uh, and good morning to our speaker. Um, it's a great pleasure to have an actual Rakas lecture uh, that we missed uh, last year. And this is our opportunity to be together to, to hear a, a great piece of new science, to uh, hear about our heritage, about the uh, Buddha Raka, and also to uh, give prizes to our excellent students. Uh, so I have the, the, the fun part, uh, meaning giving the, the prizes for students. And um, I will, we will start with this. So uh, we have several prizes. And uh, we will start with uh, the prizes for uh, excellent teaching. So um, Shahar Simon, please uh, come. So congratulations and thank you. And keep uh, this way. And the second, uh, the second prize for uh, excellent teacher is for uh, Oren Yakovian. Uh, Oren is an instructor in in the lab, not uh, in Metargel. Uh, Oren, congratulations. And now uh, we go to a uh, few prizes uh, for research. Uh, so we start with the um, a Goodman Prize uh, for excellent uh, theoretical paper. And uh, Omri Ginsburg will receive this prize uh, today. <laughs> Congratulations. Omri is a student of Avishai Dekel. <clears throat> uh, the second prize is uh, the Rosenkrum uh, Prize for Astrophysics and uh, Gravitation. And uh, Itai Sfaradi will receive it. Itai is a student of Hasaf <laughs> Torah Faresh. Congratulations. I have to my book. Uh, I was informed that our uh, the recipients of the two uh, last prizes are ill. They are sick at home. I hope they are on Zoom now. Uh, so um, the uh, Schuller Prize uh, for condensed matter uh, research goes to Meital Uzeri. Meital is not here. Uh, Meital is a student of Oded Milo and of Yossi Paltiel. So congratulations. Hopefully you are with us here. And uh, the Rakaf Prize, which is uh, for excellence in either experimental or theoretical uh, research, it goes to another student of, uh, of Oded and of Yossi, to Chen Alpen, also uh, sick at home. Congratulations. <laughs> so uh, this uh, will be kept uh, with us. And uh, given to uh, Helen Meital. Uh, we will continue <clears throat> and uh, we will have the privilege to hear uh, Professor Fanoch uh, Gottfreund, uh, who will tell us uh, uh, some interesting stories or information we will learn about uh, Julio Raka. This is also an opportunity uh, to congratulate uh, Hanoch, who just uh, recently, I think a week ago, was informed that he received uh, uh, an honorary uh, doctorate from uh, the Fry University in, uh, in Berlin. So congratulations, Kano. <laughs> uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Iran. Thank you all. And we 
keep these, these lectures, uh, these Rakak lectures every year, and somebody uh, talks about Rakak uh, so as not to let his memory just recede into history and to remind our younger colleagues to remind and to tell our students about this unique personality that Giulio Rakach was. Now, there are not many people around who had heard. You want me where? Here? As, as, as I said, uh, there are not many people around who heard courses, analytical mechanics, analytical electromagnetism, thermodynamics, and quantum mechanics from Giulio Rakach. I am one of them. Here is another one. And uh, Rakach was an outstanding teacher. Uh, his lectures uh, delivered in heavy Florentine accent, which still rings in my ears when I think about him, they were delivered, they were really masterpieces in content and presentation very neatly on the big blackboard. Every complicated expression was derived, no shortcuts, line after line. We admired those lectures. We usually used to compete for the come early to get the best seats at those lectures. Now, Rakach's joining the Hebrew University at the beginning of 1940 uh, was after already an outstanding career in Italy. He studied with Enrico Fermi in Rome and later served as professor of physics at the University of Pisa. There he worked on a number of topics of contemporary theoretical physics, among them on cross sections of Brehm's Strahlung and on electron positron pair production in the collisions of fast charged particles. Already then, one finds the seeds of his most important contributions at the later stage of his scientific career. He applied group theoretical methods to discuss the symmetry properties of tensors. This led to the book published later with his cousin, Hugo Fano, on irreducible tensorial sets. Now you see, uh, Abraham Gall is here. In those days, we everybody knew who was Hugo Fano, what were the relations. We all knew about that book. But then, because of the fascist anti-Semitic laws in Mussolini's Italy, Rakach was dismissed from the University of Pisa, and he applied for a position at the Hebrew University. Now, Rakach's arrival at the Hebrew University was a successful culmination of a long, 10 years long, actually, process of search for an outstanding theoretical physicist of international standing. Now, this search was accompanied almost on a daily basis by the involvement of Albert Einstein, Felix Bloch, Eugene Wigner, Fritz London, were among the giants of physics that were approached. Rakach applied for this position in a letter to Chaim Weizmann. He told Weizmann that even if he will not be admitted to the university, he would still go to Palestine, but not as a scientist, as a pioneer, to which Weizmann responded, you will go there as a pioneer scientist. In the margin of that letter, to Weizmann, which is in the archives of the Hebrew University, we find a remark in Weizmann's handwriting. He is a rich man, I understand. Now, this remark had its consequences. 
during the first five years at the university, Rakach's salary was only 15 Palestinian pounds, which was then one half of the salary of a refugee professor. Only in December 1945 did he receive the full salary of a full professor. Thus, our university benefited from the economic status of Rakach. Now, Rakach's appointment was supported by letters of recommendation from Wolfgang Pauli, Niels Bohr, Enrico Fermi, Henrik Anton Kramers, and Fritz London. Pauli wrote, an extraordinary mathematical talent and in perfect command in any problems and methods of modern theoretical physics. He succeeded in solving problems which deterred others. I do not know of a candidate more suitable for a professorship in theoretical physics in Jerusalem than Professor Rakach. A similar laudatory letter arrived from Enrico Fermi to whom Rakach later referred as his rebbe, his rabbi. When Rakach came to Jerusalem in 1940, he had to cope with a new country, new culture, a new language. Yet he referred to this year as the happiest in his life. During that year, he mastered Hebrew. He married Zmira Mani, daughter of a rooted prominent Sephardi family in Jerusalem. And during that year, he also wrote his first of the famous four papers on the theory of complex spectra. He also began his deep involvement in research. Scientific work for him was around the clock activity, a passion rather than an occupation. At that time, the Hebrew University had one manual calculating machine. These were the facet calculators Later, they had more, and we as students also used them for our calculations. Now, there was this one facet machine at the Hebrew University. During the day, it was used by the administration, by the accounting office. Rakach used to take this machine home at night to diagonalize 30 by 30 matrices. Working in complete isolation from the international physics community during the years of World War II, he developed his monumental original contribution to physics, which was summarized in four seminal papers, the theory of complex spectra, one, two, three, four, published in the Physical Review in the years 1942-1949. In these papers, Rakach developed the tools to treat spectra of configurations of several electrons in the D and F atomic shells. Such analysis involves the treatment of coupling schemes of angular momenta. Thus, this method is called generally algebra of angular momentum or algebra of tensorial operators, and is also known as Rakach algebra. In the fourth of these papers, after several years of struggle, Rakach found a new mathematical tool to facilitate the treatment of configurations of F electrons based on the theory of continuous groups. Equipped with these methods, Rakach launched in the 50s and 1960s his ambitious flagship project to calculate Ex the experimentally known complex spectra of atoms with filling of D shells and the more complex spectra with F shells in the rare Earth atoms. A large majority of the 15 PhD theses and almost 60 MSc theses, which he supervised, were devoted to this goal. The theory of complex spectra and the research performed at the Hebrew University made Rakach the key player in theoretical atomic physics. And our department of physics in Jerusalem became the world center 
in atomic spectroscopy. Rakach remained committed to this topic as his main activity throughout his life. At the same time, with a number of students, he began to adapt and extend his method to the study of nuclear structure. Among his best, his best known students were Amos de Chalit and Igal Talmi, who became pioneers, world pioneers, of the shell model of nuclear spectroscopy. Rakach summarized his method in a series of lectures, group theory and spectroscopy, delivered at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the spring of 1951. The first chapters served as a primer for physicists on continuous groups. The other parts are devoted to an application of the methods of the theory of complex spectra to the rapidly developing shell model of nuclei. During the following decade, when the research of elementary particle physics was based on a symmetry approach, it became clear that Einstein lectures, Einstein methods contained everything that was needed to make progress in this new approach. These lectures were delivered at the right time to serve the physics community at these new frontiers of modern physics. They were in great demand and not easily available immediately out of print. 10 years later, CERN reprinted these lectures. I cherished my copy of these lectures as a collective item and as a dear souvenir of those days. In his later years, Raka was elected as rector of the Hebrew University and served as its acting president. He did not complete his term as rector, his 25 years long and very productive career at the university as a prominent scientist, an excellent teacher, an active academic leader, ended with an untimely death from a gas leak at his home in Firenze. Rakach was the founding father of theoretical physics in Israel, and he put the Hebrew University on the world map of physics. Five years after his death, the Department of Physics of the Hebrew University was named the Rakach Institute of Physics. In the same year, the International Astronomical Union <clears throat> named officially a crater on the far side of the moon after Rakach. Today, 55 years after his death and 80 years after his arrival in Jerusalem, Rakach appears, maybe even more than in the past, as a unique player on the arena of the Hebrew University in its formative years. These were also the formative years of the Jewish community in Palestine and later of the infant state of Israel. These years brought to the university excellent, outstanding scholars in all disciplines from the best centers of learning in Europe. They brought with them a culture of research and teaching, accompanied by vigor, passion, and commitment to ideas. Julio Rakach was the most prominent member of that group. Thank you, Hanoch, for this uh, beautiful and inspiring uh, uh, short uh, lecture, long story. And uh, now uh, Snir uh, Gazit will introduce our speaker of today, uh, Snir.
Okay, thank you very much, Hanoch. So it really gives me great pleasure to introduce the speaker of the uh, 2021 Rakach Lecture, Professor Subir Sachdev uh, from uh, Harvard University. Professor Sachdev completed his PhD at Harvard University and then moved to the AT&T Bell Laboratory for his postdoctoral work. Soon after, he joined uh, as faculty to the physics department at uh, Yale University. And finally, in 2005, he joined Harvard University, where he's now the Herschel Smith Professor uh, of Physics. So uh, Professor Sajev is a recipient of many hours. I can only, would have time only to name a few of them. He is the recipient of the Dirac Medal uh, for the advancement of theoretical physics in 2015 the ICTP Dirac Metal in uh, 2018, and the Onsanger Prize of the American Physical Society in 2018. He's also a fellow of the American Physical Society, a member of the US National Academy of Science, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. So Professor Sachev's work is in, within the broad field of uh, strongly correlated uh, quantum matter, encompassing a wide range of topics, including quantum magnetism, unconventional superconductivity, quantum criticality, and quantum many-body dynamics. A unique feature of his work is the strong ties to experiment and the ability to bridge between uh, theoretical predictions and concrete experimental observations. Uh, Subir has also particularly strong ties with the uh, Israeli scientific community with uh, many collaborators across all the Israel universities. And if my counting is correct, at least two current faculty, faculty members in Israel uh, were mentored by Subir during their postdoc. And lastly, I would like to mention that Subir is somewhat of a local hero at the Hebrew University here, uh, where despite the security tension in Israel during the early 2000s, he was the only foreign lecturer uh, that did not cancel his participation and actually insisted on teaching in the 2001 uh, Jerusalem Winter School in theoretical physics. So uh, without further ado, I suggest that we uh, begin the talk. Uh, Subir, you can uh, take over. Okay. Um, so can you hear me, Smir? Okay, uh, shall I start, Snare? Can you hear me? Uh, you're muted. You can start. We, can, we hear you very well, and, and, and it should be fine. You can also. see the red pointer also? Yes, yes. It's, uh... Okay, all right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Snare, for the kind introduction. Uh, you know, it's a great pleasure to be back in Israel uh, again, uh, such as it is in these times. Uh, and of course, I've remember fondly all the in-person visits I made over the years with my many friends and collaborators there. Uh, I'm also greatly honored uh, to give the lecture in memory of uh, Professor Raka. That was a very inspiring uh, story uh, of his life that we just heard. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this honor to present this lecture and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy uh, what I have to say. Uh, as you'll see that there is a perhaps unintended connection to some of the things you've just heard about complex spectra, uh, but these will not be complex spectra uh, with a lot of symmetry. They will in fact be complex spectra with no symmetry at all, and, uh, but at least there is that connection. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to present this topic uh, somewhat in a way that I came upon it, uh, and my interest in this started uh, you know, with the discovery of the cuprates uh, in 1987 and many of the experimental puzzles that arose from uh, the from the cuprates, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit about today. Uh, and thinking about those puzzles uh, led to the introduction of what's now called the SYK model, uh, which I will describe and summarize some of its key properties. Uh, and then uh, I will actually take change gears uh, and tell you a little bit about black holes because that is the domain where there's uh, quite surprisingly and uh, not something that was intended and certainly in the early days, 
so that's the domain in which the SYK model has found its most uh, direct application and led to numerous recent advances, which I'll just say a little bit about. Uh, and then finally, hopefully I'll have time to come back to the cube rates and tell you about more recent work where we think we're making some progress in uh, understanding some of the puzzles of the cube rates, uh, which are connected uh, to also some of the progress on the SYK model. Okay, so to begin with uh, just a definition of what are the cube rates. So these are an example of a cube rate compound, nitrogen bearing copper oxide. Uh, and for our purposes, uh, it's just a, a square lattice of copper atoms that uh, sit in various layers in these crystals. And we're interested in the motion of electrons uh, in this copper layer. So if you take a material like this, uh, here's a little piece of it and dip it on liquid nitrogen, uh, it becomes a superconductor. And one of the properties of a superconductor is that it expels uh, magnetic fields uh, and so uh, it can levitate over a track of magnets, uh, as this picture shows, uh, until it heats up and goes above its critical temperature. So I, I imagine many of you seen this uh, famous phase diagram uh, as a function of temperature uh, and the horizontal axis is what we call the whole doping, but just think of it as the density of electrons in this two dimensional layer of copper atoms. So if the, uh, Whole doping is zero, meaning there's exactly one electron per copper atom in the relevant orbital, and it's an insulator with antiferromagnetism. Uh, and this yellow region uh, is where it displays the superconductivity that I just uh, showed you. But my interest in this lecture will be on neither of these regions, really. Uh, it's on somewhat higher temperatures, uh, this shaded region here, where the system is metallic, meaning that if you uh, decrease the temperature, the resistivity decreases, but it seems to have a finite metallic-like resistance. Uh, and in this higher P region, uh, it behaves like a Fermi liquid, meaning it's similar to an ordinary metal like copper and you know, gold or aluminum at low temperatures. Uh, and that's really the only reason, only re region where things are reasonably well understood. Uh, but in the remaining part of the phase diagram, there's two other metals. Uh, there's the strange or what I'll call the Planckian metal in the intermediate regime. Uh, and then, then uh, down here, there's uh, often called the pseudogap metal. So my interest here is really to talk about, you know, it's really a story of these three metals, uh, uh, which has been a puzzle that's been around since the beginning of the discovery of these compounds. Uh, and uh, I'm of the view that really understanding these three metals is the key to the whole problem. Uh, what happens down at lower temperatures is something we, we think we'll understand uh, relatively straightforwardly once we've understood uh, the metals uh, in this higher temperature range. I should also note that this temperature on the natural scale of the, of the couplings in the compound is still extremely low. Um, so it's really a regime dominated by quantum physics. Uh, but before I tell you about uh, the, the new metals, uh, let me tell you about uh, the ordinary metals to remind you what is an ordinary metal. Um, so just a quick reminder, so the theory of ordinary metals, uh, which I should uh, say is extremely successful, uh, begins by assuming that the electrons don't have any interactions. So they move in a crystal with some crystal momentum K and some dispersion E of K. Uh, and all the low energy states are occupied below the Fermi energy and the empty states uh, are above the Fermi energy. Okay. Um, and the key to the to, theory of ordinary... Um, Sorry. What? Uh, you had a question? Okay, I'll I assume uh, please mute yourself. Okay. Uh, all right, shall I continue? Okay. So the, what are the fund of, so what happens when you include interactions? So one of the uh, fundamental principles of Fermi liquid theory uh, is that the interactions don't matter much, uh, especially for the low energy excitations, which are all near the Fermi surface. Uh, and for these uh, uh, low energy excitations, you just replace the electron by a quasi electron, which for all practical purposes has the properties of an electron, except its mass is different. Uh, and then the nearly free motion of these electrons has given an incredibly successful theory of, of most metals. Uh, 
you can ask these quasi electrons, however, will eventually collide with each other. And that collision uh, leads, uh, gives this characterized by a scattering rate, which is then responsible for the finite resistance. Um, and this scattering rate in a Fermi liquid vanishes as temperature squared, uh, at least has a, it could be a constant from, uh, from impurities, uh, vanishes as temperature squared at low temperatures. Uh, and this is a very slow rate. And it's slow compared to what I'm going to call the Planckian rate, which is kT over h bar uh, as temperature goes to zero. Uh, and so what we're going to see uh, in the Planckian metal uh, is that this bound that I put here uh, is actually saturated. So you keep trying, you know, you can imagine turning up the value of U so that scattering rate becomes stronger and stronger, uh, but it never becomes larger than this. And, uh, and that's, the regime that we are most interested in. Uh, another fundamental theorem uh, is that the position of the Fermi surface, uh, or at least the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface, is some sort of a topological invariant, that it doesn't depend on the strength of the interactions. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a proof of this based on perturbation theory, which has the flavor of, a, of an anomaly matching theorem in modern particle physics. Uh, and this has also been thoroughly verified in numerous experiments. Okay, so with that lightning summary of solid state physics, uh, let me now tell you that these fundamental principles are all broken in the cuprate phase diagram. The Luttinger theorem seems to be violated in the pseudo gap metal, uh, and the, uh, the existence of quasi particles are violated in the Planckian metal. And uh, my focus will be mostly on the Planckian metal, but I'll hopefully tell you a little bit uh, about uh, the pseudo gap metal too. Uh, so let me just show you uh, just, uh, just one uh, data set for, on studies of the Planckian metal. Uh, so this is a study of uh, seven, six different cuprates and one non cuprate material uh, where the resistance, it turns out, goes linearly with temperature. And if you use the Judo formula to relate the resistance to a scattering time, uh, and there's various ways of getting all the other numbers uh, that the experimentalists have implemented, uh, you can convert the resistivity to a measurement of a time. Uh, and what they find that the inverse time is just linearly proportional to KT with no other parameters around, except this factor of alpha, which is a number fairly close to one uh, in these observations. So the fact that the scattering rate is so large and nearing this Planckian limit uh, is you know, one of the many pieces of evidence of these materials that we are talking about a metal uh, which has no quasi particles where the fundamental, even the existence of quasi particles uh, has, uh, cannot be assumed. Okay, so then, so, so that's really the, you know, the, the puzzle that um, I, I put my mind to in the early days and many other people, uh, you know, what do we, do we have a theory of a plank, what's now called a Planckian metal uh, with a rate which is just given by KT over H bar and, and Planckian because it only involves temperature and Planck's constant. Uh, and I think most people agree today that the missing ingredient in the theory of metals uh, is entanglement, uh, multi-particle complex entanglement over many scales where uh, the idea of thinking of excitations as built up of individual particles uh, fails. Uh, so you really have to think of the whole quantum system as a collective uh, quantum system on, it, on its own right. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, that's a difficult thing to do because there are very few models of such, uh, such systems, especially solvable models. Uh, and I would say that's the claim to fame of the SYK model. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a solvable model of a Planckian metal, uh, which also has the benefit of being a metal, meaning that it's a conductor of electricity and its density can be varied as you change the chemical potential. Okay, so I'm going to begin then with an introduction of what is the SYK model. It was motivated by the problems I've uh, uh, just presented, uh, but its uh, most direct impact will be on an entirely different problem of uh, black holes, which I will get to after that. So uh, let me begin uh, with an even simpler problem called the random matrix model. Uh, 
where uh, you don't destroy the quasi particles, but you simplify, you get rid of all the symmetry uh, that you have uh, in, in the theory of metals where you have, you know, you have crystalline symmetries, you have momentum conservation, let's get rid of all of that. Uh, these are, of course, things that Raka paid great attention to, but we want to simplify things even further. So one way to do it is you just pick a random set of positions and you occupy them uh, with some fraction of them with electrons or fermions, uh, and then you allow them to move. So this, this, these electrons can hop from there to there uh, and so on. Any electron can hop from any side to any other side. Uh, and the main assumption of the model is that every one of these uh, matrix elements uh, is a random number. So I can write down a very simple Hamiltonian uh, of fermions. I'm ignoring the spin here, uh, hopping from side J to side I with an amplitude Tij. Um, and we just take this to be a set of uh, random numbers, independent random numbers. So the important thing is that they're independent. Beyond that, nothing much matters. It's not, it's not that important. So this is a you know very strong assumption, but as we know, uh, this random matrix model has been uh, incredibly successful in the last decades in understanding chaotic quantum systems. So for example, if you want to understand the properties of the electron spectrum in the, in the billiards, uh, which you know has no just randomness in it at all, uh, the spectrum has properties that are very well modeled statistically by this random matrix model. Okay. So given that success, you know, we are hoping to extend that type of success to interacting electron systems. Uh, so what's known from the theory of random matrices? Well, in this case, the, you get, also I presented this as a many electron problem, but it's really a one electron problem. There's no interaction. So all you have to do is diagonalize the N by N matrix with random uh, uh, matrix elements. Uh, and what you get from that is, is, a, is a density of states in the limit as n goes to infinity, uh, which is the famous uh, semicircular distribution. Uh, this is made up of individual electron uh, energy levels, which are spaced, roughly speaking, spacing one over n. So if you want to take the n goes to infinity limit and then look at the low temperature properties, uh, they'll be dominated by and the density of states at the Fermi level. So all of these states are occupied and these are empty. So I'll call rho naught the density of states at the Fermi level. Uh, and as you learn in uh, solid state physics, once you have a finite density of states at the Fermi level, uh, the Sommerfeld expansion gives you an entropy that vanishes linearly in temperature. And the coefficient gamma is related to the density of states by this connection. Okay, now I want to take these very familiar properties uh, and describe them in what will seem like a very complicated way. I'm going to describe them in a many particle way. So I'm not interested now in the single particle states, I'm interested in the many particle states. I can build up all the many particle states from the single particle states uh, simply by occupying them, just adding the energies of the occupied states. So you have uh, you know, n alpha zero one, you just add them up and you get the energy of the many body states, which I call E sub A. And then what I'm plotting here is just a numerical evaluation on some big matrix of the density of states, D of E of these many body eigenvalues, which are just some of the single particle eigenvalues. So this is, what, this is the density of states. Uh, this is the zooming at the bottom of the band. And these are the individual levels at the bottom of the band. So one key thing to remember at the, these states at the bottom of the many particle band have nothing whatsoever to do with what's happening in the bottom of the single particle band. They have to do with excitations across the Fermi surface. So everything at the bottom of the many particle band is what's happening at the Fermi level here. Oh, okay. So what do you see? Well, first of all, if you look at a regime where the energy is extensive, meaning proportional to N, then you can quickly deduce the density of states by just by thermodynamics. Uh, in the microcanonical ensemble, the density of states is just the exponential of the entropy. I told you the entropy in the canonical ensemble, as you learn in solid state physics, and a simple Legendre transform will give you the entropy in the microcanonical ensemble. And this is what it is. It's E to the N gamma E. Now E is about N, so this is exponentially large. So that's any thermodynamic system has an exponentially large entropy in the size of the system. It's of order e to the n because e and e is of order n and the square root gives you a factor of n. 
Okay, so that's what happens when the energy is extensive. Uh, but now let's make the energy smaller. Uh, let's go down to the bottom of the band. Now what's happening here? Now I just told you what's happening here is that you're just occupying the energy level states near the Fermi level. And the spacing between those states is one over N. So therefore here, when the energy is about one or order one over N, uh, the density of states is much, much smaller. The density of states is about N, not E to the N, because there's very few states, uh, very few quasi particles available. So there's a fundamental property then of this random matrix model, the existence of quasi particles and the number of quasi particles always have energy level spaced by one over N. Uh, so the density of states is much smaller and that's why you have these tails. All right, so I spent a lot of time just telling you about the, the very simplest uh, quantum mechanical problem, a random matrix, and now let's settle these. Uh, now let me get to the SYK model. Uh, it's very similar. You take a random set of positions and you put in a random set of electrons and you allow them to move. Uh, but now they're not going to move one by one, they're going to move two by two. So for example, you pick a pair and this pair is now going to hop together um, and, uh, and so you can't tell which one's going where. And so the two of them are gonna to hop to their new positions uh, and effectively they've been entangled. So there's a term in the Hamiltonian that has this, allows them to hop in this way. Uh, and then you can pick any other pair and they can also move anywhere else. So you can see easily there's n squared ways of picking pairs and n squared positions they can go to. So there's a order n to the fourth uh, uh, terms in the Hamiltonian that move these electrons around. And, and what is the SYK model? Well, it's just the model where every one of those n to the fourth terms, which I'm now calling UIJKL, uh, are ra independent random numbers. So you, you don't have one particle hopping, but you only have two particle hopping with independent random numbers. Uh, really, that's all there is to it. Uh, so this model actually appeared in the 80s. I was totally unaware. Uh, when we proposed a variant of this in 1993, uh, it appeared in nuclear physics, uh, but uh, they did some numerical studies, but did not understand uh, the very, all the structure in the large N limit that I'm going to describe. Okay, uh, and so I'm going to call here Q as before the density of electrons. All right. So if you take this model and let me just tell you what happens when you just put it on a computer and get the same quantity D of E. Uh, the big difference here, of course, is I cannot think of E sub A as a sum of single particle levels. It's all the energy levels of this many particle system. And so now you get this density of state that looks like this. Uh, it doesn't have the tails. It looks much smoother down to the bottom of the band. And that's one of its remarkable properties. Um, and you can just look at right at the bottom of the band and at least in this finite system, I think it's about 65,000 states. It's still quite dense at the bottom of the band. So but let's ask, you know, in this regime here where the energy density above the ground state is extensive. Uh, so this is what you get. Uh, so this term here is exactly the same term that I had for the free particle case. Uh, square root of 2n gamma e. Of course, gamma is, has, is some other number now. It's not related to any single particle density of states. But the, the remarkable new feature is this extra term, e to the n s naught. Uh, it, so both terms are extensive, uh, but this term doesn't vanish as e goes to zero. And this number s naught turns out to be a uni universal number that we computed with the uh, uh, George and Parcolet in 2001 uh, for this model and has since been computed for many other models. Um, and so the entropy in the temperature language therefore doesn't vanish as temperature goes to zero, but goes to the number S naught. All right, so this might seem a little disturbing. Uh, it may seem like you're violating the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, it might suggest some exponentially large degeneracy in the ground state. Uh, but that is not correct. Uh, as you can see from the energy levels here, there's no degeneracy at all. Uh, and, but the density of states down here uh, is also known today, uh, uh, is, uh, is still exponentially large. Uh, okay, so what's happening here um, is that the energy level spacing is still exponentially small at the bottom of the band, 
just as it was uh, in the middle of the band, even for the random matrix model I told you earlier. So that whole behavior goes all the way down to very low energies. Uh, and this is immediately then, uh, you know, essentially a proof that you know, this system doesn't have quasi particles. You know, it doesn't have electron quasi particles. It doesn't have any other type of quasi particles you could imagine, some fractionalized particle, nothing, because there's just not enough quasi particles to give you so many low energy excitations, which are exponentially large. And there's no degeneracy. It's just that this level happens to be closely spaced. Um, okay, so this. Correction here um, is only recently determined. Uh, I'll give you the references in a little bit. Uh, in fact, what's also known is the crossover between these two limits, uh, where you uh, get the cinch density of states. Uh, and this is uh, you know, beautiful results that comes has had a huge impact uh, in this in quantum gravity. And I'll tell you about that a little bit. Uh, if you convert this density of states to uh, from the canonical to the micro canonical, to, from the micro canonical to the canonical ensemble, you get an entropy, uh, which is the same I showed you here, but you get the first correction in powers of one over n, uh, which is as minus three halves log t. Uh, and, and that's, uh, um, you know, comes from the inverse Laplace transform of the cinch function here. Um, okay. Or, uh, that's actually a Laplace transform. <laughs> All right, so so that's the basic properties of the SYK model, and uh, at least determined numerically. Uh, and the, what I've shown you here is the absence of quasi particles. Now, what I had mentioned earlier is that the absence of quasi particles seems to be connected to this uh, Planckian relaxation time or Planckian dissipation time, and that's also obeyed by the SYK model. The simplest quantity you can look at is just the spectral function. This is the energy for adding or removing an electron, probably the amplitude for adding or removing an electron. Uh, so that has a, a form which decays with frequency, but it decays on a scale, as you can see from this factor here, which is the Planckian rate, it's Planckian frequency, kT over h bar. And it's independent of your coupling, u. You can make any u anything you want. Uh, it won't affect the frequency scale at which this decays. So there's a Planckian limit dynamics showing up, not only in this property, but even in non-equilibrium properties that have been studied uh, more recently. Okay, so that's a summary of the basic property of the SYK model. Uh, it's absence of quasi-particles. You can also get the same solution at any density. Uh, so it's a metallic-like states, uh, and it's very peculiar behavior of entropy at low energies. Um, uh, which also, you know, is uh, essentially proves the access, the absence of quasi-particle excitations. So uh, now, unlike the tradition of Raka, I unfortunately didn't prepare uh, a detailed derivation of these results um, uh, with all with no details left out. So I have uh, asked your uh, uh, permission here just to summarize, and uh, I am happy to refer you to other lectures I've given if you want to see a few more details. So anyway, just to summarize then, and, and uh, just an inkling of where these results come from. Uh, so the fundamental property uh, is that there's some low energy theory that seems to be scale invariant, independent of U, and the only temperature or any sort of external scale that you put in, like temperature, determines essentially all the dynamical properties. Uh, in fact, it's richer than that, as we also happens in the theory of critical phenomena. If you take, you know, we understood scale invariance. Uh, uh, of, of, as an RG fixed point for the theory of phase transitions in say like the Ising model. Uh, and, and then later on, it was realized that you could actually make good use of an even bigger symmetry, which is conformal invariance. Here we have a system that has no, no, no space, only time. And the analog of conformal invariance is just time reparameterization invariance. So there's a low energy action you can write down for the SYK model which is invariant under reparameterization of time. Tau goes to f of tau. Uh, and if you look at only the lowest energy term, they don't depend upon what your, how, the rate at which your clocks are running, as long as they're monotonic. OK, so that turns out to be the key uh, property for understanding a lot of the properties I've mentioned, and also the connection to black holes, 
because uh, reparameterization invariance is also a fundamental property of uh, Einstein theory of gravity. Uh, so in this case, however, the time reparameterization invariance is not perfect. Uh, it's broken uh, by at least some small terms. And so there is some energy to fluctuations of, the, of f of tau. Um, and just like, you know, if you're talking about uh, spin wave fluctuations in a magnet, you know, when you want to talk about spin waves, uh, because that's a very low energy distortion of a magnet, you don't worry about everything else in the magnet. You just derive an effective action for slow variations in the orientation of the spin. So similarly here, you can derive an effective action for slow variations uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the time reprogrammization uh, itself. Uh, and uh, so get an effective action, which was, uh, was written down by Kitev and uh, various aspects were solved by the people here. Uh, and there've been many developments on it since then. And from this effective action, uh, which unfortunately I haven't written out, you can now derive all the properties I've described. Uh, at least, so you get the correction to the entropy that I showed you, uh, minus three halves log T. Um, and the inverse Laplace transform of this gives you this density of states. Um, and in some recent work, and I, which uh, I'll refer to a little bit later, if you apply this to some a more physical model for the cube rates, it also seems to be the key ingredient in one of the major puzzles in the cube rate physics with the fact that the temperature resistivity is linear in temperature. But this requires some new ingredients that are not present in the SYK model, particularly uh, fractionalization, which I hope to tell you a little bit about uh, towards the end of my talk. Okay, I think I'm making good time. So maybe I will be able to get to section four. Uh, so let me now go on to, to black holes. So seemingly complete change of gears, uh, but uh, as you'll see, uh, there is in fact a remarkable connection uh, between, you know, just quantum gravity uh, and systems without quasi particles. They seem to be really two sides of the same coin of a, of a bigger picture of systems with strong entanglement. Okay, so what is a black hole? Well, classically, black holes uh, is a very dense star. Um, and uh, so dense that light cannot escape past the horizon. Uh, and these are solutions of Einstein's uh, uh, equations of general relativity. Uh, there's a horizon which depends on the mass that's uh, enclosed inside the black hole, M, uh, and Newton's constant is the velocity of light. Uh, and everything inside here is trappable forever uh, in, in, in Einstein's theory. Um, so just as a reference for Earth mass, this mass, this radius is only nine millimeters. Okay, uh, so we want to think about the quantum mechanics uh, of black holes. And this was a subject that uh, really started with uh, Jacob Bekenstein, uh, who came up with some remarkable conclusions. I'll try to give you some flavor of those conclusions from a modern perspective. Uh, so where you imagine what happens to quantum entanglement uh, across the black hole horizon. So imagine you have a pair of qubits which are entangled in a singlet pair and you separate them across the black hole horizon. Uh, since there's nothing singular at the horizon, I think uh, this, uh, you know, the two particles don't even know they're equal sides of the opposite sides of the horizon until of course this one uh, gets crushed in the center of the black hole. But at this point, they don't know that. Uh, and so you still expect them to be entangled. Uh, so the, if, you know, if, if you measure your particle on the outside, it will in principle collapse the wave function of the particle on the inside if one is up and then the other is down. Uh, however, from the perspective of the observer outside the black hole, uh, since you, can, you have no direct access uh, over any reasonable time uh, to the state of this qubit, uh, it's simply not there. So as far as you're concerned, this is just a random qubit uh, and a random state really has a temperature. So, so that's a very quick and dirty way of at least accepting the fact that black holes are both an entropy uh, and a temperature. So these were the, the basic conclusions uh, originally by Bekenstein and then Hawking uh, Bekenstein had an entropy and then Hawking had a temperature called the Hawking temperature T sub H. Uh, Bekenstein uh, 
deduced that the black hole entropy must be proportional to the surface, surface area. Well, that was a conjecture, really. And then Einstein Hawking, with an explicit computation, showed that it was in the case and even got the prefactor, uh, which is a factor of one quarter that I'll show you a little bit later. So this was the shocking conclusion uh, from essentially semi-classical application of quantum mechanics to black holes um, by Beckins and Hawking in the, in the mid 70s. And this led to you know, many puzzles, which are still the focus of attention uh, of physicists today. Uh, the biggest puzzle is what is this? It's a, if you actually compute the entropy, it's extremely large. Uh, so where are the degrees of freedom? If I have, want to have a Boltzmann-like interpretation of the entropy as statistics of many, many quantum states, uh, where are the degrees of freedom that are forming these quantum states? Uh, in the calculations of Beckett and Einstein and Hawking, you, the only degree of freedom is the graviton and, uh, and gravity itself. And that certainly doesn't seem to have enough degrees of freedom to account for this. Um, uh, so, of course, since then, uh, there have been calculations in the string theory, which gives you a microscopic uh, derivation of the, Be of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily imply that black hole is actually made of a string. It just shows that there's some consistency in this whole picture. Uh, another question that Hawking especially emphasized that, that there seem to be some really strong puzzles in, uh, what, in the flow of quantum information uh, carried by a black hole. So in other words, if you, if you add extra information to a black hole by throwing some matter in, uh, that information seems to completely disappear uh, and you can't directly see it in any of the radiation that's coming out. So eventually when the black hole evaporates completely, uh, then uh, what happened to that extra qubit you sent in? Could you tell that you threw it in uh, from just collecting the radiation? All right, so these were puzzles that have preoccupied string theories for a long time uh, and are still doing so. Uh, let me just summarize that there's been a lot of progress in these puzzles. And one of the things that uh, has been learned is that many aspects of the black hole entropy and quantum information are really independent of the microscopic details. and the semi-classical theory of Einstein gravity turns out to be remarkably uh, accurate for certain things uh, and get them correctly, even though you may not know whether the black hole is made of strings or some other qubits or whatever. Um, and this can, uh, you can still compute many things uh, in great detail. Uh, I mean, perhaps this is in condensed matter that we are used to this type of thing uh, in a much simpler context, really, but uh, it seems the same is true here. Okay. Uh, so to tell you a little about the recent developments and the connection to the SYK model, I need one other property of the black hole, which has been known for a while, um, but I show you here uh, uh, just a very recent PRL, which looked at data uh, from LIGO. And what they were looking at uh, is what you call the relaxation time of black holes, where you're just looking at the, uh, the ring down time. You have uh, two black holes merging, and once they merge into a perfect sphere, there's a short time where they vibrate a little bit and then relax to complete equilibrium. And so you can measure this from, uh, uh, from observations. And it turns out that that time is exactly the Planckian time where this temperature here is the Hawking temperature of the black hole. Now, I hasten to add, it's not a quantum process. It's a pretty classical gravitational thing. Uh, uh, reason being that the H bar appears both in the Hawking temperature and the and here, and so it just cancels out in the time that you get. Uh, but nevertheless, it's quite interesting that the time here is Planckian. So that's the third fundamental property of black holes. And there's they have a Planckian rate relaxation. And from my perspective, that means that there are must be some connection to non-quasi particle dynamics. So, uh, so that was part of the motivation for this paper I wrote in 2010, uh, where I looked at not just the relaxation time, but many other properties of certain black holes. Uh, I started to learn a little bit about black hole physics in those days. Uh, and when I was looking at those properties, it suddenly reminded me of this, of this work 10 years ago, uh, where I had seen exactly the same things. So that's why I said this corresponds implied that certain main mean field gapless spin liquids, today they're called the SYK models, are states of matter realizing the physics of eight uh, black holes with the horizon, which is ADS2 cross R2, and I'll show you what that is in a minute. 
anyway, I spoke about this at the strings meeting uh, in 2010, and uh, the universal reaction was a shrug of the shoulders because strings purists were not really uh, accustomed to thinking about models with random coupling. At least that's my reading of it. They just couldn't make head or tail of what I was saying because I was talking about random couplings. Uh, but today you will find random couplings everywhere in string theory. Uh, and uh, the reason being that, as we know from studies of quantum chaos in single particle physics, uh, that random Hamiltonians can be extremely useful in studying uh, chaotic systems. And it turns out they're also extremely useful in studying many body chaotic systems with strong entanglement, because many of the properties you care about uh, like everything I mentioned so far, the Green's function, the entropy, and the entanglement entropy, all self-average. And so you're better off just studying them in a model that's easier to solve, and somehow ra random systems are easier to solve. Okay, so, so now we can describe the connection to SYK model a little more precisely. So let's just start with doing, you know, uh, the foolhardy thing. Let's just try to evaluate the partition function of quantum gravity. Uh, we just write down the Einstein action in three plus one dimension in a black hole background and try to evaluate this partition function. Uh, this is, of course, totally foolhardy it's because nobody knows how to evaluate this. It's full of all kinds of infinities. Uh, but nevertheless, in 1977, Gibbons and Hawking said, let's see if we can make sense of this. And, and what they, they did was, well, let's just look at the saddle point of this solution and forget about the fluctuation. The saddle point is certainly well defined. It's purely classical. Where does the entropy come in? Uh, uh, where does the H bar come in uh, in a classical saddle point? Well, it comes in from the fact that you can put in quantum mechanics uh, as uh, the, the length of time, imaginary time. So when you're evaluating the partition function, uh, the, the time circle in, uh, in the partition function in imaginary time has length H bar over KT. Uh, and that's precisely where uh, that's the only place where h bar appears in the evaluation of the saddle point. So in a very clever calculation, Gibbons and Hawking made sense of this and came up with an answer by uh, making sure the boundary condition would be treated properly. And the answer they got was exactly the same answer uh, that Hawking had obtained earlier by very different methods. So that convinced them they were on the right track. Uh, and so you get the Bakkenstein Hawking entropy, which is the area of the horizon uh, divided by 4g h bar and the velocity of light cube. Uh, okay, and the interpretation we can now give uh, is that this is an entanglement entropy. Uh, and that's why, unlike any other physical system, it's proportional to the area of the horizon, uh, not the volume enclosed by the horizon, that would be the case in any other quantum mechanical system, because it's only the entanglement across the horizon uh, that gives you uh, this what looks like a thermal entropy from the outside because the quantities you're entangled with inside the horizon have been forever separated from you. Okay, so what we'd like to do is improve this answer of Gibbons and Hawking. Just put the question mark, question mark, question mark. Uh, we can't do that today, at least not for Einstein gravity, but we can do it for a slightly different black hole uh, this is a black hole which has a net charge. So you take the Einstein-Maxwell's equations uh, and you write down a black hole solution with a net charge, which uh, has been done by Reisner and Nordstrom. Uh, and these solutions have a peculiar feature, uh, which is that as you zoom into the horizon, uh, the transverse directions uh, of the black hole completely decouple. Uh, so you can write down uh, the theory of gravity fluctuations uh, in near the horizon of a black hole, just in terms of a theory in one space, which is the radial direction zeta uh, and time. Um, and uh, so we end up looking at two dimensional quantum gravity, which is a lot simpler. Okay, so here's another uh, picture of it. Um, so this is the transverse directions X. This is the time direction zeta, which goes to infinity at the black hole horizon. Uh, that's the horizon there, and uh, its area yields the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And so for a finite black hole, the, the metric is ADS2 cross S2. S2 is just the transverse direction, the X, which we just ignore. Uh, and ADS2 
uh, is a space with uniform negative curvature. So it's a space in, it's a two dimensional space uh, which has uniformly negative curvature. Uh, in Euclidean signal, it's the same as hyperbolic space, the first uh, you know, uniform negative curvature space discovered by Lobachevsky, I guess. Okay, so it was this ADS2 that I mentioned in my paper and amazingly many properties of the Reisner Nordstrom solution uh, in this ADS2 perfectly match the properties of the black hole. Uh, one of which is the way the black hole entropy increases with, uh, with charge is exactly the same as in the SYK model uh, as it is uh, in the Reisner Nordstrom solution of Einstein gravity. Uh, okay, so, so there seem to be some mysterious connection between the Bekenstein Hawking and the Reisner uh, entropy of a classical gravity and the large end solution um, of, uh, of the SYK model. Uh, and then it was Kitev who decided to ask an even sharper question. What about corrections to one over n? What about quantum fluctuation corrections to classical gravity and, and to the one over n expansion for the SYK model? Amazingly, those also match. Uh, and what happens in, 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 in gravity? Well, in gravity, you have to, you know, lower, closer to the horizon you are, you're looking at things that are lower and lower energy. So you have to move away from the horizon to look at uh, higher energy properties. And what happens to the geometry uh, is that out here, far from the black hole, you're back into three plus one space time dimension. So there's a crossover from effectively a two dimensional theory to a four dimensional theory. Uh, and there's a boundary where a lot of interesting things happen. So what was shown by Kitab and Maldasena and Stanford that, that the corrections are dominated by the fluctuations in this region, including its boundary. Uh, and this boundary graviton is in fact exactly the same as the timely parameterization mode of the SYK model. So it has just one time direction. So this is this is a bit of a, I'm a, uh, the, the drawing is a bit leading. This direction is supposed to be time and I draw the boundary graviton, not X. It's uniform in X. Um, okay, so what have I just said? I said, if you're trying to evaluate the path integral uh, of Einstein Maxwell gravity, if you just do it the Gibbons Hawking way, you will get an answer, which is proportion to area of the horizon. Uh, and we're going to be interested in very low temperature properties. Uh, so at low temperature, just from Einstein's equations, you can work out this temperature dependence. And you notice it's constant plus linear in T. Uh, remember the linear in T temperature dependence of the entropy uh, of, a, uh, of the SYK model. And that in fact precisely matches what comes here. Uh, and then we have to put a, fill this in. So what I've just told you is that if you want to fill this in, you can just uh, focus on a theory of quantum gravity in two dimensions and its boundary on ADS2 and its boundary. And then you play around with ADS2 and you make some changes of variables. And I apologize for the lack of uh, details. Uh, there's, you're actually writing a long review article where all the details are there. Uh, what you get is some boundary action for the time parameterization along the boundary uh, f of tau. And this action is exactly the same action that you get from the SYK model. So you can start with two very different theories. You can start with the SYK model of just randomly hopping electrons in pairs and do a bunch of Hubbard Stratonovich transformations and go to low energies and you get some low energy action for time reparameterizations. Or you can start from Einstein gravity uh, and do this dimensional reduction uh, and fix the gauge in a clever way and you get exactly the same action. <laughs> All right, so, so that's a very precise connection then uh, between the SYK model and this uh, Einstein gravity. Now you might, you might not rightly be puzzled here, you know, this, the stuff I've told you about Einstein gravity is not new. This could have been done in principle already at the time of Hawking. Uh, they knew all of the, they had all the ingredients uh, and they could even, they even had a section on the charged black hole in the Gibbons Hawking paper. Uh, and they could have decided to go to low energies and do this, but it wasn't done. Uh, indeed, it was done after uh, the same thing was carried out for the SYK model first by Kitev. Uh, and then very quickly people realized 
you could have done it already <laughs> uh, starting from uh, the, back, the Gibbons Hawking theory of black hole entropy. So in this case, uh, we can apply the results I already showed you for the density of states and the entropy of the SYK model uh, and tell you the density, the entropy of the black hole. So this is the, the Bekenstein Hawking term, just proportional to the area of the black hole. And now this should be viewed as an expansion in G, the Newton constant, the SYK model extension in one over N. Uh, so the Newton constant is small in appropriate units. So this is the leading term, the area term, uh, and this is the first correction. Uh, and it's the same three halves log T. Now what comes inside here is of course, a highly non-universal for the, for the SYK model. It was the coupling U, here is the Planck mass. Uh, but uh, so you so that you can't get. We don't know what should happen here. That really depends on the microscopic details. But if you're just interested in this three halves coefficient, it doesn't matter. It's the same. That's universal and independent uh, of UV details, and it's a property of a generic uh, black hole. Uh, there are black holes in string theory, and they will have different corrections because those have supersymmetry. And this is really uh, special, special to the case with. Uh, without supersymmetry. So then the summary then is this picture that I showed you of the many body density of states, at least this part here, uh, is the density of states of an actual charged black hole, we believe. Uh, okay, the individual levels will of course depend upon all kinds of details, but if you only care about the energy depends on the density of states and this form here, uh, that's the cinch form right here, that's all universal. Uh, and these are the states. <clears throat> that make up the you know the black hole um, the value of s the s naught is replaced by the Bekenstein Hawking term which depends on the area of the black hole which depends on how it's embedded in higher dimensions and so on uh, so the value of s naught and the value of gamma depends on uv details but everything else uh, is pretty much the same all right so uh, by my count i have about uh, well, let's see, yeah, 10, 10 minutes or so left. Is that correct, Sneer? Okay, I assume I'm correct. So let me now go to part four uh, and back to the cube phrase. So, which was the original motivation for uh, working on the SYK model. Uh, and, uh, you know, over the year, and it's quite amazing to have uh, found. Uh, uh, so many applications in uh, in a domain that I never imagined. Certainly, in 1993, this was even before the discovery of the area safety correspondence from Marla Sena in 97. Uh, but anyway, so now let's go back to the problem that's closer to my heart, uh, to the Q phrase. So we want to understand, to remind you, uh, something about the Planckian metal, uh, and perhaps uh, also uh, the pseudo gap metal. So. You know, now we can't avoid going to the microscopic physics completely because obviously that's we can't just work with some random Hamiltonian. So, what is the microscopic physics? Well, at p equals zero over here, uh, it's an antiferromagnet. And what that means is that uh, these are the copper, each uh, side of the square lattice is a copper atom, and we only need to focus on a single orbital uh, on that atom. Uh, and the spins form this arrangement, this checkerboard arrangement, half of them up and half of them down. Uh, it's not a perfect antiferromagnet because there is an exchange coupling J, which causes them to fluctuate back and forth, but only a little bit. And so the, the memory of which electron is up and which is down is retained. And this is a classically ordered state. So now what we want to understand, of course, are the metals that appear when you remove a few uh, electrons and now now these holes of density p uh, can move around and the amplitude for that is called t that's the amplitude for the holes moving around uh, and but there's a very important constraint you can never put two electrons on the same site uh, so this state has to be eliminated uh, uh, and, if, uh, and and so you're going to this electron hop back it could have exchanged the spin uh, so that is the model we need to understand. So that's it in pictures. That's all it is. That's called the PJ model. Uh, and we've been struggling theoretically to understand it in, uh, in, in great detail. 
so the SYK model, uh, you know, okay, well, it wasn't proposed in the form that I wrote it down uh, in the early days. Uh, but it, it took the approximation of uh, just making everything, all the couplings random. And we, we're we going to do the same thing now, just make the T and the J random and all to all and couple any side to any side. Uh, but what the SYK model does not have is, it, you know, it can't be a complete theory of the cube race because it doesn't have this stop sign. It doesn't prohibit any kind of double occupancy. It doesn't have even have an insulator at any density. It's always a metal. Uh, and so what's key is to put the stop sign back in. And that, at least that's been our, uh, our route to progress. We put the stop sign back in, but don't worry about anything else. We don't worry about any of the symmetries, even the fact that the square lattice perhaps is not as important for a first theory. So we're going to take what's called the random TJ model. We take a cluster of sites and electron can hop from any site to any other site. Uh, and singly, unlike in the SYK model, they can only hop in pairs. They can exchange their spins uh, with some amplitude JIJ, which is another random number, any pair of them. Uh, but very, very important, they're forbidden from occupying the same site. That's the piece of physics we have to keep. Uh, all right, so this is a, a nice model. Uh, we'd love to solve it uh, in the limit where you, where you have zero doping and you take random GIJ and classical spins. That is precisely the sherrington kirkpatrick model of spin glasses, uh, which has led to you know, incredible uh, impact in all fields of physics. Here, uh, we are putting quantum mechanics for spin a half, and we're not so interested in the spin glass phases, we're in the metallic phases, where in fact, all the complexity of the spin glass behavior uh, disappears, but some other uh, interesting new physics appears as I hope to convince you. So, so this is not solvable uh, in the way you can solve the SYK model, uh, but so we put it on a computer. There are two recent studies uh, on, on numerically studying it. And this is the phase diagram from the top paper here as a function of temperature and doping. Uh, and interestingly, they, they see, you know, at First glance, it looks very similar to the cuprates. Uh, you have a Fermi liquid at large P. Uh, you have a, a Planckian metal, in fact. And from the numerics, you see a, some kind of scattering time, uh, which is proportional to KT and independent of microscopic details. And spin correlation functions, which uh, I didn't work out, uh, decay as one over time. So uh, in the SYK model. So for some mysterious reason, uh, in this plank, in this regime here near this critical point, uh, you do see uh, Planckian SYK like behavior. And then finally, at very low doping, the classical physics rears its head and you get spin glass order at low temperatures. Uh, it's not so easy in this particular study to study that, but the second paper has some work on it. Uh, and one of the things we did uh, in both papers actually was to look at the status of Luttinger theorem at higher temperatures. Uh, and there's a way of defining the Fermi energy, even in this random system. And so what you find is that uh, at higher doping, the Fermi energy matches the Fermi energy of the non-interacting problem, uh, but at lower doping, it doesn't. So there's a sort of breakdown of, uh, of the Luttinger theorem, just as you find ob observationally in the cuprates. All right, so this is a, you know, a extremely simple model. I mean, a, an artificial model, random hopping in exchange. But most importantly, it has the stop sign. Uh, and that seems to capture broadly, uh, you know, all of the major puzzles of the metallic phases of the cuprates. Uh, so this raises a bunch of questions, even, okay, you've got this model now, and how do you understand what you're seeing? Uh, how do you understand the appearance of SYK criticality in the TJ model, which has single particle hopping, it has a T term, which is just a single particle term. Uh, what is the origin of the lawn? Not in the Fermi energy in the pseudo Gartner. So the missing ingredient in the SYK toy model that I gave you, uh, we believe, um, at least, uh, is fractionalization. That you really have to think about this random model in, a, in terms of fractionalized variables, and then many of these rather mysterious observations in the numerics become easy to understand. So that's what I'll give you a little flavor of before I conclude my talk. So. Why, is, why do we need fractionalization? 
well, this is the fact that we need it in general is been around for a while. Uh, but why do we need it here for the SYK to understand this particular set of numerics? Uh, so the key thing I told you, the TJ model is a stop sign, meaning that and on any given site, there are only three states, uh, empty, spin up, or spin down. Or in other words, there's a constraint on every site. Uh, the number of electrons on every site is less than or equal to one. Uh, if you had didn't have this constraint, you could have a doubly occupied side, but you're throwing out. And that's a piece of local physics that we have to keep. Now, this kind of uh, inequality is very hard to implement in any kind of analytical treatment. Uh, what's much easier is to convert it to an equality. Uh, and that's done by introducing fractionalized degrees of freedom. And uh, there's many ways to do it. Here's one way to do it. In fact, the different ways of doing it turn out to be important for our solution. Uh, you introduce a, a new set of particles, which you call B, which we'll call, let me call the hole on, and F we'll call the, the spin on. Uh, in this particular representation, F is a fermion and B is a boson, as the symbols, uh, symbols imply. And then you assert that you're, there's a constraint in your Hilbert space that the, the sum of the number of bosons plus fermions is one. So there's, again, if I just, Tell you, I'll tell you what I've just told you, a spin and a half fermion and one boson with this constraint, how many states do you have? Well, there are three states, exactly the ones written here. And this we map then uh, to one to one to these three states. Then you can take various operators. You can take a spin operator, which rotates the spin here. Well, that's obviously just the spin operator in terms of the spin-ons. Just replace the electron with the spin-on. Uh, and then you have the electron operator itself, C. What does the electron operator do? An electron operator takes you from here to there. So C up will take you from here to there. And in this picture, you got to annihilate the fermion and add a boson. And that's exactly what the electron operator is. So this is the fractionalized representation. Now, the moment you do this, now there's an emergent gauge invariance. You can rotate the phase of F and B without changing any of the physics. And so this theory becomes a gauge theory as emergent gauge fields and fractionalization, another big theme in, in many, many uh, works uh, in condensed matter these days. Uh, anyway, so, uh, right. So, so in these sets of variables, another thing to note is that both the electron operator and the spin operator are bilinears in terms of the fractionalized variables or they're kind of rotation operators, both of them at an equal footing. And that turns out to be the key for the SYK model, uh, the connection between the random TJ and the random SYK model. So this is the original TJ model with the hopping and the projection of the W occupied sites. Now I just use a fractionalized representation. Uh, so you get, this is the hopping of the electrons, this is the rotation of the spins. And now you notice that both of these terms are two particle terms. They involve in some space, moving two particles at a time, not one particle at a time. And you know that should set off alarm bells because it was precisely that feature that gave you all the special properties of the SYK model, was only two particle hopping. Uh, the randomness is somewhat different and okay, many details are different, but that's the key thing. Uh, these are four parton terms or fractionalized terms. So it's like a fractionalized SYK model. And this has precisely the phase diagram I showed you in the numerics as we've learned from various methods. So. You can reproduce uh, this sort of phase diagram by doing uh, you know, this one here, by doing a large end theory, uh, at least may most aspects of it, uh, of the type that I mentioned, and really match many of the things that you see. Uh, OK. All right, so I think I've then uh, made the connection then between, hopefully, uh, between the random TJ model and SYK physics and how you get this uh, you know, very satisfying phase diagram from this random coupling, random this model here, uh, with TIJ and JRJ random numbers, uh, which matches what you see in the experiments, uh, you know, much better than an ASNE right to. Uh, so they've also, we can also ask, say a little bit more about the pseudo gap regime in non random systems. Uh, that's a problem that uh, Sneer has been working with, uh, working on. Uh, and there also you find that uh, there are many cases and Sneer has found a 
beautiful example in this recent paper, how fractionization uh, can lead to Fermi surfaces that don't have the Luttinger volume. Uh, so that's really the key to the pseudo gap metal phase uh, in my view and I think the others views too, and that you need some kind of fractionization uh, to violate the Luttinger tube in the pseudo gap metal. And what we have learned from our recent study is that it's also very helpful in understanding the nature of the critical point. Just SYK physics won't give it to you on its own. All right, so let me then summarize. Uh, I have told you about the SYK model, which is a solvable model without quasi-particle excitation, uh, exhibiting thermalization and many body chaos in the time of our H part of KBT. Um, I mean, these are just assertions, but there's a lot of work in many papers on, on these, uh, establishing these facts. Um, and, and this natural time is independent of microscopic energy scales. Uh, the low energy theory of the SYK model uh, has it's sort of the flavor of a spin wave nonlinear sigma model, but it's not spin wave fluctuations, it's fluctuations of time reparamizations. And these time reparamization are nothing but reparamization of time of a boundary graviton, uh, a boundary of ADS2. Um, and these and this and these fluctuations of this boundary graviton, you just evaluate the path integral, um, you get a correction then to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy at low temperatures of any charged black hole. Um, now, there have also been a lot of work recently on this quantum information problem I mentioned recently uh, in, in the middle of my talk, where what happens to an extra qubit that you may throw in a black hole, what happens to its quantum information? There's been a lot of exciting advances that I'm certainly not qualified to give a talk on. Uh, these involve wormhole geometries, not ADS2, but wormholes uh, between a pair of black holes. Uh, and But again, the same time reprogrammization mode, this boundary graviton, uh, plays a fundamental role in understanding these wormholes. And in fact, you can also get wormholes by taking two SYK models and coupling them together. Uh, and there's also been a lot of work on that by Marcel Franz and, and others. So, uh, so I'm optimistic that there's a lot more to do here, connecting uh, SYK models and quantum information and black holes in a really fascinating way. Then the second part of my talk was uh, more down to earth about the physics of the three metallic phases of the cuprates and this random TJ model seems to capture them quite well. Gives you a pseudo gap metal at small doping with spin glass order, Fermi liquid at large doping. And most interestingly, really for the first time in any clear cut numerical study, uh, Planckian metal all the way down to zero temperature. Um, and our current understanding of this behavior is that you can understand it in a in, a, in some in a, in a different expansion uh, by using this fractionalized representation. So if you combine SYK physics with fractionalization, you seem to have a pretty good understanding of uh, what's going on. Uh, and in the context of the TJ model, uh, and again, I didn't show you this, but if you just Turn the crank and look at the effect of the boundary graviton or the time reprimage in SAF mode on the resistivity, you get a linear and T resistivity. Um, so at least in this context, this boundary graviton is, uh, is the key missing ingredient in solving uh, or making some advances in two major problems in physics. One is the linear T resistivity of the Planckian metal, uh, and the other uh, is understanding better quantum information of uh, black holes. So thank you very much. Okay. So thank you very much, Subir, for a very inspiring talk. And uh, I guess we're a little bit over time, so we'll have uh, time for a few questions. Maybe we can start from some people from the uh, from Zoom. If you want to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand. Maybe yeah. I can start. So it seemed like somehow the um, the theory on the SYK part requires some uh, fermionic statistics, which is somewhat absent on the uh, gravity side. Is there something special about uh, uh, the SYK side being fermionic, which enables this, or uh, like the information um, about the fermionic statistics sort of lost in the this duality somehow? Uh, so. 
Oh, that's why I said yes. The, the fact that I, they were fermions is extremely important for getting this phase of matter. Uh, and, and so what happens is you start with these, the UV degrees of freedom of fermions, and, uh, and then you uh, uh, integrate them out effectively, and you get some low energy theory, which is this time we print them in soft mode. Now on the gravity side, we don't know what the UV degrees of freedom. There could well be string theory, which definitely has fermions in it, and supersymmetry and God knows what else. Uh, but we are now, so we are, so you know, uh, when I was, did this step. So, yeah, so we want to go from, from we want to fill in these question marks in gravity theory. So what we're doing is we're starting with this Einstein-Maxwell theory, which has no fermion, as it correctly said, and going to even lower energies. But we can imagine starting from this theory and going to even higher energies. Uh, in the SYK model, we can do that. We can go all the way down to the very highest energies and at the very highest energy, it's just fermions sitting on sides. Uh, you know, UV is just fermions on the lattice model. What is the very high energy behavior of this theory? Uh, we don't know, we don't know, I think. Nobody knows. <laughs> it could be string that probably involves fermions. However, the, the remarkable fact is that we don't need to know. We don't need to know what's higher energy than here uh, because we can, starting from here, we can go all the way down here, down to, and even get not just the leading term uh, in the Bekenstein Hockney entropy, but also the first correction. The next term probably depends on what's at higher energies. But the uh, amazing thing is, just like Bekenstein Hawking found, that they didn't need to know what the black hole was made up of. And we have learned now that you don't need to know what the black hole is made up of to even get the next term. And this next term is, has been totally crucial in all of these wormhole physics that people have been talking about. Okay, thank okay. you very much. So, I, see we have, I see we have a question from uh, Asa. Hi, Subir. Great talk. Thank you, Asa. Uh, question about the resistivity. Uh, you, so, so you show uh, the lifetime uh, is related to temperature and H bar, but uh, if, in order to go to resistivity, you need another energy scale. Uh, how is that depending on microscopics? Yes, thank you. So I, I was, of course, <laughs> I could have given a whole talk on the resistivity, so I apologize for the lack of details. Uh, but so the first, um, so first of all, you have to take a model with a sense of space. So you take a high dimensional model where you can define a resistivity from the spectral function. Uh, and what you find is that the, the model has a residual resistivity. Uh, and, and then the first correction to the residual resistivity um, is, 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 is rho naught. Well, let me try to use this. So the resistivity, as a, you can see my, my oh, I should stop sharing. This is where I've been teaching from. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my uh, uh, my my whiteboard here. Yeah, so so rho of t is rho naught times one plus some uh, turns out to be some number I call c gamma times t, and what is this gamma? Uh, the gamma is the same gamma that appears uh, in the specific heat. Uh, is uh, you know n times s naught plus gamma t, uh, and that gamma is about a one over u. Uh, you can see that, yeah. Uh, so there is an energy scale. So the whole theory is backed up by just one energy scale, which is gamma. Uh, and this number c is a universal number, at least in this model, and we can compute it. Uh, it's in our paper. So the you know, so I can also yeah. I mean, let me take this opportunity to also write down this mysterious time reparamization action. So the action, the low energy partition function of S, Y, K and the black holes, very schematically is the integral over time reparamization, exponential minus some action of F of tau. Uh, and the action of F of tau uh, turns out to be gamma over four pi squared, if I remember right, uh, times what's called the Schwarzian, uh, F of tau and tau. And the squiggly symbol is a combination of the first and second derivatives of uh, F of tau called the Schwarzian. 
So this is number gamma. So this coefficient is non-universal. So you can get gamma either from XYK model, or you can start from Einstein gravity and figure out what it is in Einstein gravity. Uh, and so it's just some number we have no, you need to know the UV to get gamma, but that's the same number that appears in the resistivity in the specific heat, uh, in the density of states uh, and, you know, and the entropy. I see, thank you. Sure. <laughs> we have uh, another question from uh, Frat. Yeah, hi, yeah. so uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Frat. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask, maybe you said it and I somehow missed, um, uh, why why is uh, the random uh, random J random T model uh, uh, capturing the, the coup rates? I mean, uh, we, we can accept that uh, uh, you know the TJ model is a good starting point. <laughs> for, yeah. Yeah. With with uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, non-random coefficients. Uh, so is it uh, uh, capturing somehow the, the high temperature limit of it or why, why is the randomness? Uh, um... Yeah, no, the, I, the short answer is I don't know, but I would say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, and randomness is mostly introduced to simplify things for us. Uh, but I would say that, uh, when we are talking about systems without quasi particles, you don't have much quantum coherence. Uh, so there's no possibility of any localization. They can be local so they can, in the spin glass phase. Of course, there is some kind of spin localization, but not electron localization. Uh, then it's you know the basic physics is is this fact that some of the carriers are localizing in the pseudo gap metal and others are not in, in the Fermi liquid. They are all conducting. So we want to understand this transition between two metals, one where uh, some of the carriers localize and one with none of them localize. Uh, and you know what became clear to us after many years was that even the random TJ model had this transition. You know, so really the point of view is, uh, can you find you know study all possible models you can think of in which you have uh, a change in the size of the Fermi energy or the carrier density? In a metal, without look, you know, without any kind of uh, 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 you know uh, disorder-induced localization, uh, and this is one model that has it. And it turns out, you know, quite surprisingly, really, I'd agree uh, that it seems to capture even the critical behavior uh, well. So recently, we've been trying to. So the, to me, that's the main puzzle: why does it get the critical behaviors? you know, at least compatible with the experiments. Uh, the phases themselves, you know, you can kind of argue have to be there. All right. So so recently we have been trying to study models without randomness, like a Fermi surface coupled to a gauge field, which you might think, you know, is, a, is another possible critical theory where you go between two different Fermi surface sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, yeah, we're trying to put in randomness there and try to see exactly what happens in some opposite limit where the randomness is weak rather than here where it's all to all. Uh, we're still working on that and hopefully that will give us more insight. Uh, but you know, in a very hand-waving way, the idea is, is just that these are highly chaotic systems uh, and with fast as possible many body chaos. And when you have that behavior, uh, random systems are easier to get at the uh, you know, self-averaging physics. So you're replacing self. What's actually happening in a real system is averaging uh, because of uh, you know, eigenstate thermalization or something like that. But here it's happening because of randomness and that's easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, randomness makes eigenstate thermalization much easier to access, let me say. It's not causing it. Yeah. OK, thank you. Okay, we'll take one last question from the crowd here. Thank you for the talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yes. you. Okay. So uh, you told us about a surprising and fascinating connection, a single theory describing both the conductance of some solids and on the other hand, some aspects of black holes. I wonder whether uh, we can take this analogy one step further, push it forward, and claim that the 
solid could have itself some kind of black hole or analogous black hole in it. More specifically, a black hole would need to have a horizon. So does the solid have in some sense a horizon? I understand that it is homogeneous. So if it has a horizon, it would have to be the whole thing would have to be the horizon. And then I would ask, does it describe also the inside of the black hole or only the near horizon zone? So that's my question. Can we push forward this analogy, which I understand to be abstract? Can we try to push it forward and claim that in some sense, the solid is really some kind of an analogy of a black hole? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, I, I think you know the word analogous black hole used in other contexts where you have Cherenkov radiation in superfluids and somehow that's analogous to horizon. Certainly in that sense, the answer is no. Uh, it's not like that at all. Uh, you should, it's really, um, it, it's more thought of as a duality that there is, there are two sets of variables. Uh, what's accessible to you in a solid or an NSYK model are the electronic variables and electron green spots. And that's what's acceptable to you. Uh, and that those sets of Green's functions are um, have a certain low energy theory uh, and certain low energy properties, uh, but the, but the things that are accessible to you are uh, are the electronic time dependent correlation functions of the electronic system. And those will have the, the you know the time dependent correlations will have some features which are if you wish fingerprints of the horizon, but not a horizon in the sense that uh, an observer would see near a black hole. Uh, right. So, so you can. So the point is, you can take make a duality between these sets of variables that are physically accessible to you, and a very different set of variables which would be physically accessible in if you actually had a black hole. Uh, but those black hole variables, you know, the geodesic to a infolding observer in a black hole is something highly non-local and complicated in 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 terms of the uh, physical variables of the solid. Right. So, so it's, I think that's I think that's a simple thing to keep in mind that there is a uh, this duality between different ways of looking at things, uh, but the duality is nevertheless very helpful. You know, I'm, so I'm not going to go and look for a horizon uh, in in my solid the way people uh, try to do when looking at superfluids with Cherenkov radiation. It's not like that at all. Uh, but you can make you know, in the dual set of variables, ask a dual set of questions, which will teach you something about the other side, and that's. You know that's been very very productive in the in, in recent years. So I think uh, one future direction which I hope will be will be studied is to now study these wormholes. Can you get an analogous wormhole? Uh, I would I shouldn't use the word analogous. A dual system to a worm wormhole, uh, where you take two SYK models and you study, for example, you know suppose you add a pulse on one side of the SYK model. How long does it take to appear on the other side and dissipate its energy, or how long does it take to disappear? Uh, is there any revival of the wormhole on one side from the other side of the pulse you add on one SYK model to the other SYK model? And many of these questions have a have a dual answer into sending information through a wormhole uh, in gravity. But there's no actual wormhole here. It's just a different set of questions that you're addressing. Okay, so I think now it's a good time to uh, end the talk. So let's uh, take this opportunity to thank again uh, Subir for a very inspiring uh, talk. And uh, we very much hope to see you in person <laughs> in the near future. And uh, we, we thank we're you, unable to accommodate you in person here, but uh, given the situation, it's <laughs> understood. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you again for... Bye. Thank you. It's a great honor. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Well, thanks, Eris. Okay. Bye. I have to end the meeting now. Okay. Okay. <laughs>